Amen. All right. Ecclesiastes chapter number 4, verse number 8 is where we're going to begin reading. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 8 says, There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, For whom do I labor, and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter number 2. Genesis chapter number 2. We're going to be coming back to Ecclesiastes chapter number 4, so if you still have your bulletin, you can slide your bulletin in there. I derived the title of my sermon from Genesis chapter number 2. I want you to look with me at verse number 18. The Bible says this, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. The title of my sermon this morning is, It is not good for man to be alone. I'm going to be talking about and preaching about the importance, according to the Bible, of social interaction or human interaction, of having accompaniment and having someone that is considered a help for you. Now, this is going to be spanning all throughout life, in all different areas of life. And right here when we look at Genesis chapter number 2, right in the very beginning of creation, we can see this principle taught in a, very, in, a, in a way of being a general truth as well. Now, of course here, it's speaking of woman being created, right? Woman being, being created to be a help need for man. But there's also a deeper truth here. I want you to look at Genesis chapter 2, verse number 18, at the exact words that God speaks and says. He says this, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. Notice those words. So God makes the statement that it is not good that the man should be alone. And this is taught all throughout the Bible. This is what we're going to be looking at this morning of the importance of having human interaction and the importance of socialization in our lives. Now, what he's saying there when he says it's not good for man to be alone, he's saying that it's not healthy. It is not healthy for a person to just be spending a lot of time by them, themselves or to just be spending their life, if you will, just by themselves all of the time. And when you really examine this passage, and you really look at what's taking place, it, it teaches you and shows you the importance of having humor, human interaction in your life. Because what took place here was God created man. And man was there, and God looked at the situation, and God said, of course God created him in mind for a partner. But he created man, and he put man there in the Garden of Eden, and he looked at man, and he said, it is not good for man to be alone. It is not healthy for man. It is not right for man to be alone. And that teaches us and tells us that the way in which we are designed or the way in which we are created is to have human interaction. God desires for man not to be alone. God desires for man to live a life where he is accompanied by other people or a life that is full of socialization where people are often and commonly socializing with one another. I want you to go with me back to Ecclesiastes chapter number 4, and we'll see how this is taught very strongly where we were just a moment ago. The same <clears throat> principle, truth. Not only that, it is so important that you have socialization in your life that God created a mate for man. He created a mate for man, which is woman, where man and woman would continually be together. Think about how much and how often God desires for you to socialize, where he designed a system where man marries woman, and then they move into the same house, and they are constantly together all the time. Just all the time you are meant. Man is designed to get married 
to, and then to spend the rest of their life socializing with another person. So that gives you an idea and a deeper understanding of just how important and what God truly meant when he said it's not good for man to be alone. Not only that, when people go out and work, you know, uh, you know, oftentimes, who are they with? They're with people. They're with others, aren't they? I want you to look here with me in Ecclesiastes chapter number 4. I'm going to get into my first point on why it's not good for man to be alone. Ecclesiastes chapter number 4, verse number 8 again, it says this. There is one alone, and there is not a second. So notice, it's saying that this man is totally alone. There's not even one other person with him. That's what that means. There's one alone and not a second. Not even one other person. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his labor. So he just, this is a man that even though he's by himself, he's just continually working, isn't he? Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? Now notice this. This is also vanity. And then it says this. Yea, it is a sore travail. What is that saying? That's teaching that it is it is sorrow. That is what travail is. When a woman is in travail, uh, you know, it's referring to the fact that she's in sorrow. So the very first point in why it is not good for man to be alone is because social interaction, social interaction is important in order to give you happiness. Social interaction is good and, and is, and is uh, necessary in order for you to be happy. A person that is by themselves is going to be a sorrowful person. A person that is all by themselves and that is alone will be a sorrowful, depressed type of person if you live that type of lifestyle. This is also what is being implied and taught when we go back to Genesis chapter number 2. When he is saying it's not good for man to be alone, he's saying it's not healthy for him. Mentally, it is not good for a person to spend all of their time by themselves. 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 7 speaks also about marriage and, and the importance of having one another. It says, likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge. So notice the emphasis on that they're living together, they're dwelling together. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And then it says, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. So in order to, in order to you know, uh, socialize, or in order, I'm sorry, to have happiness, in order to not live a sorrowful or depressed life, you must have socialization. You must have human interaction. And in fact, it, I mean, it is a proven, it, it is proven, and you can even use this, and you can look back and personal, uh, personally attest to this, I'm sure, in your life. Think about the most sociable place in basically the entire world. And what is it? Most people, I'm sure, here went to the public school system, right? It is just where they just take all the children in an entire city and just throw them, you know, into this one, you know, a system of where just every, all the children are there. You have 50, 60 kids in a class sometimes, 30 kids in a class, however many children that they put into the classroom. And I'm sure that you can attest to this. If you look back and you remember maybe who your friends were, people maybe that you weren't friends with as well, you know, the, the happiest children at the school were the kids that did what? That socialized the most. If you look back and you think about the children that were the happiest kids, that were constantly smiling, that were constantly in a good mood, were the kids that were what? They were sociable children. When you look back and you think about maybe high school, who were the kids that you could just look at and it was obvious that they were not happy? It was obvious that they were, they were sad, that there was something missing there. Who were they? They were the kids that secluded themselves from others. They were the kids that, that withdrew themselves from the group, the kids that sat by themselves, the kids that didn't have social, social re, uh, interactions with others, the people that weren't you know, reacting, uh, inter interacting with you know, other humans, other people that are like them, other you know, uh, 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 children. They weren't getting that social uh, interaction with others. Now, and, and, and I'm sure that you could say this as well. If you think about it in your life, one thing, especially in the morning when you wake up, maybe you're tired, you're not in that good of a mood, doesn't it make you feel that much better? You know, you're, you're driving to the, to, to the job site or to the work location. Don't you feel that much better once you arrive and you start seeing other people? And people start saying hello, good morning to you. You start seeing a smile on other people's face. You know what starts happening immediately? It starts cheering you up, doesn't it? It starts making you feel better. You know why? Because man was designed, we are wired in our brains to have human interaction. It is important for you mentally in your life, 
If you are going to be stable and you are going to be healthy mentally, it is important for you to have much human interaction and to socialize with others. If you look at people that are depressed people, what do they not want? They don't want to be around other people because those things do not coexist. You know, there's this, this vicious cycle when people get depressed that they want to do what? They want to go and be by themselves. It, it, it forces them, there's almost something that compels them to go and be by themselves and to be away from other people, isn't it? Because they realize that that, that is how, and there's this, this strange thing that's in the mind of a depressed person where they want to stay depressed and they want you to leave them alone. That's this vicious cycle. And they know naturally that the way in which they can stay depressed is to stay by themselves. And the old additive of how you're going to get somebody out of, you know, it's, it's the perfect, you know, uh, a quintessential or stereotype of how you get someone out of being depressed. What happens? Even in the movies and things, the friend goes over to the house, don't they? And start talking with them. And you know what happens? They start feeling better. You know why? Because human interaction is necessary for happiness. Human interaction and, and socialization is necessary. It is a staple of your human health. In order to be a happy person, you must have socialization in your life. You must have human interaction. So much that God gave you a permanent person there that you can just interact with socially all day. When you go home so that you're not by yourself all night, when you get off work or whatever time you're there, some people just work from home. Oftentimes that's what people used to do in the past. They just worked on their own property. See what they were doing? They were constantly all day just spending their, their day with their wife all the time. Man. Just going in the house, walking inside. God wanted it to be that way, where you would have a person with you all the time. You know why? Because it's not good for man to be alone. Right. It's not good for man to be alone. And oftentimes, people get this, they can fall into a rut where they want to seclude themselves. And it's not healthy for you to do this. We need to understand the importance from God, God giving us advice, why it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to give you the second point here. Number, number two, the reason why uh, God, it's good to have accompaniment or to have more than one person is because it's needed for work. It's good for work. I'm going to tie all this together at the end. It's good for work. Look there at Ecclesiastes chapter number four, verse number nine. There's multiple reasons why it's good for work, but look there at verse number, let's read verse eight again because it actually ties in with verse number eight as well. It says, there's one alone, and there's not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother. Yet is there no end of all his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor, and bereave my soul of good. This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. Now, there's a couple of applications to this. Number one, of course, you know, the application is that you have this other person that you can spend the money with, right? But I want you to look at verse number 10 as well. It says this. It, it goes a little deeper. It says, For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. So notice that it goes deeper than that. It's not just that you have this person that you can spend the time with, but also that he is a help to you. He's actually referred to as being a help. And this is something that we see all throughout the Bible, where someone, when they are assigned a job, or when they are assigned work to do, they are often assigned in pairs. They are not sent out. It is not common in the Bible for someone to be sent out just to work by themselves. I want you to go with me to Mark chapter number 6. The, the, the most important work that there is, of course, is soul winning. And that's the example that we're going to begin with. Mark chapter number 6, verse number 7. Mark chapter number 6. When Jesus Christ sent out the soul winners, just like we do here, we send them out in pairs. We send them out with a help. We send them out with another person that they can interact with and can be there with them. And there's multiple reasons why this is good. Mark chapter number 6, I want you to look with me at verse number 7. It says this, And he called on him the twelve. And then it says this, And began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. So we have to step back and we have to understand there's a purpose for this. Because couldn't have Christ called the twelve and sent the twelve out individually? You know, from one perspective, a person may say, hey, wouldn't that be more productive? It wouldn't be, but a person could stand back and say, hey, wouldn't it be more productive if they just went out by themselves, just each person individually? 
So he could have done that. Couldn't that have been an option? Of course, but he decided that when he was going to send out the soul winners, he wanted them to have a partner, or he wanted them to have a helper there with him when he sent them out. I want you to go to Luke chapter number 10. Luke chapter number 10. We'll talk about some of the reasons why it's important to have help, to have someone with you, just through life in general. So keep this just uh, 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 in your mind about just general generalities of life of why this is important. We're going to use different examples. I'm sure you'll be able to think of others also. Look at Luke chapter number 10. We're going to see this happening again just to show you that this is an actual structured system. And he's choosing to do this this way. Luke chapter 10 verse 1 says this. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. So that wasn't just, hey, he was just felt like he was going to send them two and two, or maybe it was circumstantial where it was best when he sent out the twelve to send them out two and two. No, this is an actual system that Jesus is using, because when the twelve came to him, he called them, and he sent them out to go preach the gospel, he made sure that he broke them up and he gave each person a partner. Then when he brought the seventy, this takes place after he already sent out the twelve, he calls the seventy to him, and he appoints them as well to go out and to do work. And you know what he does? He also breaks them up into pairs. He also desired or wanted them to be sent out with a partner. That each person would have a partner. So you can see that this is a clear system. This is not accidental. This is methodical. He has a method here and he desires for them when they go out to have a partner. We do the same thing here. We try to always make sure that when we are going out soul winning, that we send someone out with a partner. That someone doesn't just go out by themselves. Amen. Now, overall, the reason for this is efficiency in the larger picture. It's more efficient if you have a partner. And there are multiple reasons for this. Multiple reasons for this. Now, number one, one of the main reasons you could say, well, I'm going to get more, I'm going to get deeper into this in just a moment, uh, but protection. Uh, one of the main reasons is for protection or for safety, if you will. That's one of the main reasons why it's important to have someone else with you. But I'll give you some other reasons so that you can learn to go soul winning. If someone just now, can you imagine if someone just now came here and you know, let's say even say that I did a soul winning uh, uh, you know, presentation, a soul winning seminar, and they came and they attended it. A new person joined the church, they just got saved, we got them saved. They came out and they were like, hey, I think that's good that you guys are going out and preaching the gospel. I want to learn how to do that too. So I can get people saved just like I got saved. They come and they sit down and I decide, hey, we're going to do a soul winning seminar so that you can learn to go soul winning. I do the soul winning seminar. I preach often. That's one of the themes of my sermons for, for a period of time, a month or so, where I'm just constantly hitting on soul winning and, and all different types of tips. Can you imagine even if every sermon was on the subject of soul winning for three months, can you imagine if when you guys went out soul winning, I sent that person out by themselves? Doesn't that sound ridiculous? You know why? Because they have to learn to go soul winning. So you want to know one of the main reasons why it's great, it's more efficient that you go with a partner, is so that you can learn to go soul winning, especially in the beginning. Not only that, you're constantly, if you pay close attention to your partner, that's why it's good to listen to the person when they're also giving the gospel. You will continually learn things from your partner, as will they learn things from you. Because when you're out soul winning, you're always learning new things, aren't you? And you're always implementing new things. Now, your partner may not know that that's, always, that that's new. But you're implementing new things that you've learned while you're out soul winning, and you are putting that into practice. And you know what? It's a good chance that maybe your partner hadn't heard that before either. Yeah. And you've just learned this, or maybe you, you were asked a question that you had never been asked before. It caused you to go home and study the scripture so you could have a good, solid, firm, sound answer for that, right? And then the next time you go soul winning, you're ready and you're prepared, and that same question gets asked. You, you, and you're prepared, you're ready, you give, them, you give them the answer. How often do you learn something from your partner? If you're paying close attention. I mean, often, don't you? All the time you learn something. That's another reason why it's good to switch up partners. Maybe. You go with different people. Different people have strengths. Different people have weaknesses. You know, some people, like I said, maybe learned something recently. Maybe you haven't went with them in three to six months, maybe eight months. So it's good to switch up partners and to go with a different partner. And then you can pick up something new from them that maybe they learned in the past eight to nine months. So there's multiple reasons why it's good that you go out Logically, why it makes sense as you, as that you should go out with a partner and not just go out by yourself. 
I want to show you this pattern throughout Scripture where people are sent out when they have a job in pairs over and over again. So I'm going to read to you. We first, let me say this. First, we saw uh, Jesus sending the twelve out to preach the gospel. And he he broke them into pairs, didn't he? Specifically, broke them into pairs. Not only that, he sent out the seventy. He sent out the seventy to preach. Gave them a job, and what did he do? He broke them into pairs. Matthew chapter number twenty-one, verse number one says this: And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem. And we're come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives. Then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. So notice that, that when he sent them to do this job, what did he do? He sent two disciples. Luke chapter number 7, verse number 19 says this, And John, this is John the Baptist, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? So John the Baptist also, when he sent out his disciples, notice he didn't call one. This is methodical. He called two and sent those two together. Acts chapter number 9, verse number 38 says this, And for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Acts 19.22, so he sent Macedonia, two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. Even all the way back to the Old Testament, Joshua chapter number 2, verse number 1, and Joshua the son of Nun sent out, to, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho, and they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab. And lodge there. So see this principle over and over and over again. When someone is sent to bring a message, when someone is sent to do a job, they're not sent out by themselves. You know why? Because it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for man when he's going out to do a job, when he's going out to work. In a general sense, it's not good. It's better if man has a if man has company. Accompaniment accompaniment is important for man. That was just the times where in which Two, specifically the word two, that is. T-W-O is used when someone is sent out by two. I searched sent and two. There were other times, many times, where I thought of my own mind that I did not include. Just like all the times when Paul and Barnabas, those two are going. Uh, the time when John, Mark, Paul, Barnabas, and one other person, I can't remember, gets into the dispute. When they leave, what, ta what takes place? Paul ends up taking one person with him, and the other guy takes one person with him. They already understand the system that if we are going to work, we both have to have a partner. We need to have another person with us. Why? Because we need a helper. We need a partner. It's important when you're going to do work or when you're going to do a job that you have another person with you. That person you can learn from. That person you can teach. That person also is there for the purpose of protection. They are there also for safety. That's the third point. So I'm going to get more into that. But the third point is it's necessary for safety. It is necessary for protection. I want you to go back there to Ecclesiastes chapter number 4. Ecclesiastes chapter number 4. So I said it's needed for work. That was the second point. Of course, the first point was it's needed for happiness. You're a happier person if you spend time with other people. You're an unhappy person if you seclude yourself and you spend your time by yourself. It's just a fact. You know, you will be mentally unhealthy if you spend too much time alone. Number two is it's good for work for many reasons. You learn from each other. You teach each other. And then number three also ties in with that. It's good for safety. It's good for protection. There in Ecclesiastes, I dropped my spot, so let me get back there. Ecclesiastes chapter number 4, you'll notice that that's being taught here. There's, like I said, there's multiple applications of this. Whoops. Ecclesiastes chapter number 4, notice what it says again. It says this in verse number 10. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him. Him up. Now there's a physical, there's a literal and physical application to this. That it is good that if you have another person with you when you go to do work. Let's use soul winning to, to begin with. It's good that if you're sent out, and like the area that we were in yesterday, I mean, I, was, I wasn't worried, I wasn't scared at all for myself, but you know what? I didn't want to walk around the corner and leave the ladies there by themselves either. Right? So in that sense, what well, was good that there was other people there to protect it. 
It was, it was good that there were other people there that had an eye out. I definitely wouldn't want to, you know, you wanted just one of the women to go up and go to a door or go around the corner all by themselves. It was even better that they had another person there with them. So even when you go to a dangerous area or what's relatively dangerous, if you will, it's better if you take someone with you. It's better if you don't go there by yourself. Even if you feel like that you're man enough or you're strong enough, you never know what could take place. Someone can come up from behind you. When I'm in a, you know, a dangerous area sometimes, I like to just make sure that I don't ever put my back to where someone can walk up behind me. I don't know if you do this, but when I go and sit in a restaurant, now I did this for a long time, you know, just subconsciously and didn't realize what I was doing until I one time noticed how fixated I was in sitting in a corner. That I didn't want my back, I didn't want my, uh, many people, or especially major ingress and egress, where my back was. Because I want to be able to see everything, right? Well, it's good that if you have another person standing there with you that can have your back. That's where that comes from. Another person that's there with you that can see from another angle. That's there and they're prepared to help you if something were to happen. That if you were to fall, if you were to be you know, uh, injured, if you were to be hurt in some way or another, you have this other person independent from yourself that can help you. It's important when you go soul winning to have a partner for safety. It's important when you go soul winning to have someone else with you for the purpose of protection. If you think about this, this is a random point. You know what a, 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 a form or a method of torture is? Something called isolation. You know what that does? It causes you to go crazy. They'll put people, they'll take people in other countries, you know, in China, you know, that they practice this. Uh, you know, I don't know how public they are about it, but I know that that was a big form of torture in uh, uh, in China or in the Asian area where they would take a person. What they do is they completely cut them off from human interaction. They completely cut them off from socialization with others, and they will put them in a room by themselves and leave them there. And they'll, they'll maybe, it's a dark room, you know, there's nothing you can see really, and then they'll, they'll have like a little trap door and they'll feed you. They'll keep you alive, but you know what happens over a period of time? You lose your mind. It's not good for man to be alone. You start to become, you know, uh, unstable mentally. You start to lose, you know, your, your, you know, you know, different faculties that you have. It destroys your entire system. It makes you physically ill. You know why? Because it's not good for man to be alone. Multiple reasons. We can look at multiple different reasons why it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for man to be alone in the sense of, of, of safety, even at work oftentimes. The real churn at some companies where they want people to do things in pairs and for a good cause. You know, uh, I've heard before about companies that will do uh, different types of work, uh, especially work where people have to get in attics, where they will they mandate that if you have to do attic work that they send another person with you. And the reason being is because oftentimes when people get in attics, if it's too hot, they'll fall out. They'll just pass out. And they'll pass out up in that attic while the homeowner's walking around. They're not necessarily keeping track of time. They may not even know that you're in the attic. And then, you know, an hour, two hours go by, and maybe, you know, something uh, drastic took place with your health, and you die up there. See how it's not good for man to be alone? When you're doing work sometimes, it's important to have another person with you. When we do work on lifts at my job, a lot of what I do, right now I'm, I'm doing a job where i got to work super early in the morning at Amazon. And we're working like 50 feet in the air. It's required to have three people. Three people while we're operating the scissor lift. One person up in the lift with you and another person on the ground. Ultimately, you know what the reason comes down? You know, there's, you can be more specific, but it's because it's not good for us to be alone. That's the reason. It's not good for man to be alone. Because you need someone else that's on the ground watching what's going on. Watching your back. Paying attention, making sure you're not going to run over anything and, and cause the lift to, to flip over or anything like that. You've got another person up in there with you so that they can watch your back. And sometimes when you're moving that thing around, I'm normally the one driving it. You know, the partner or the person that I'm with will say, hey, watch your head. There might be a little part of the iron, the Z-bar of the structure in these days. You know, normally they're framed with iron and not wood. Where I'm not aware of, i got to kind of duck under it or something. You know, that's, it's not good for man to be alone. You'll see this in a lot of cases. You know, you've heard about people going out, elderly people sometimes, maybe that were farmers. Well, they do, they go out, and they go out to do their work day, and then they never come back. 
Sometimes they have cardiac arrest while they're out there working. Sometimes maybe they had a seizure and something else happened on top of that, right, because of that. Sometimes, you know, there could be all different types of, 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 of uh, ailments that could take place. While they're out there by themselves, you know what they didn't have? They didn't have someone there with them to help them when they fell. They didn't have someone there. You know, many times when people will have a heart attack or a stroke even, especially a stroke, when you have, you know, some sort of physical, a serious physical, you know, attack of some sorts, people's lives are saved because another person is there to help them. People's lives are saved because there's another person there looking out for them and to make sure that that person is okay. I heard about a crazy story one time that my dad told me about a guy who lived by himself. And uh, I hope this isn't too detailed, but this guy lived by himself and he got into the shower to take a shower. And the guy uh, had some sort of, uh, of, uh, of attack. I don't know if it was, uh, uh, like I said, heart, you know, cardiac arrest, like a heart attack or a stroke or something like that. And he slipped and fell. And he smacked his head when he did so. At this time, like while he was having the stroke, he, you know, the guy fell on the ground as well. And they, they know that because they observed his head later. And he had hit his head, and then that on top of that knocked him unconscious. And the guy laid there for a long time, and because of the stroke, he wasn't able to move himself when he woke up. So they, they determined from whatever test that they ran that the guy eventually woke up. It was something that happened where he wasn't able to get up. And they found the guy like three months or a, a long time later afterwards. And he, the water, the way that they found, maybe it wasn't that long, maybe it was a week. They determined, the way that they found out that this had taken place was because his water bill. The water company realized that his water had been running for an entire week. So they sent somebody out there, and this is the part that I hope it doesn't bother the kids. The, the, the man laid in the shower for an entire week, and from the, from the, the water of the shower, it had drilled a hole in his chest like this. Just from continual pressure from the water, just you know, pounding him in the chest for like a week or two weeks or something. Yeah, You know why? Because the guy was all by himself. And the guy, they said the guy could have certainly lived if another person was there and would have found him or heard him, they could have gotten him up and helped him out there. That's the reason why God desired for man to not be alone. That's a perfect example of why God desired for man not to be alone. Man, God, you know, there are exceptions to certain people that maybe live a life where they don't get married, a man that doesn't get married, or a woman that doesn't get married, where they just serve God with all their time. But by and large, God's plan, 99.9% .9 of the time, is for man to have a wife. And if you look at the situation, you're saying, hey, what if this guy would have done it? God's like, I don't know his whole situation. I'm just using this to prove a point. You know what would have happened? He probably would have been alive. It would have saved his life. Why? Because it was good for another person to be there with him for safety. It was good for another person to be there with him for protection. I'm sure many workers out in the field where their lives were saved because there was another guy there having their back. When Jesus sent out his soul winners, when he sent out his disciples, he wanted another person to be there with him. Why? Just in case one person fell, he wanted to be able to help him up. Just like Ecclesiastes chapter 4 happened. That man that fell in the shower, he didn't have anybody to help him up. You know, people that maybe fall out in an attic, they don't have a partner there, they don't have anybody to help them up. I'm not saying that there isn't work sometimes you're going to have to do by yourself. I'm just saying the principle is still true. Whether or not your company doesn't feel it's convenient, I'm saying that it's best if another person works with you. They may not want to pay another person to be on another job and on that same job site with you, but, but principle-wise, it is a general truth that it is best that if man doesn't spend time alone, that man is with other people that he's socializing and that he is interacting with others. Now, I have, uh, I have, the last point is this. It's needed, this is going to be my last point. It's necessary just for, uh, it, let's say this, emotional support or mental support. It's good for, let's word it this way, moral support. It's good to have another person to have socialization. It's good to have human interaction and to have people that you're close with, that you're constantly speaking with for the purpose of human interaction, or, or I'm sorry, for moral support, or for, you know, mental stability. I want you to look with me at Ecclesiastes chapter number four once more. This is our text, and we're, we're, this is going to be the last point, and i got a couple of other uh, 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 last uh, subset points that I'd like to give you, and then we'll be finished. Ecclesiastes chapter number four, 
We look at the physical application of the person that's working and falling. But also, this is poetic. Ecclesiastes is very poetic, and there are deeper meanings to this. There's also the moral support reason. I want you to look there at verse number 9 again. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Verse 10, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. And then it says this, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Verse 11, we're going to read 11 and 12. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? Notice the advantage of having that other person there, just in general. Look at verse number 12. And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So notice there that we have a couple of different things that the Bible is teaching us. It's using physical examples. Physical examples, like if someone were to attack another person, it's good to have someone else with you there. And it's even better to have a third person. That's what it's teaching, right? And not only that, we see that it's speaking about, you know, if two lie together, right? No, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, yeah, again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? So notice, again, it's trying to emphasize the advantage of having another person with you or having, you know, socialization, having, you know, not being, the whole point of it is not being alone. Then in verse number 10, it talked about a person that fell. It spoke about a person that fell, and it said that what that other person could do for you is he could lift you up again, couldn't he? If you were to fall, it said, woe unto him, the man that falls and, by, and, and is by himself. Why? Because he doesn't have another there to help him up again. Now, of course, this is poetic, and it's very deep, and, and you can definitely apply it as I did to something physical. But even more so than that, it applies to the spiritual and it applies to the mental. Now, life is not a constant, you know, just flat line. Just where everything is the same or just a constant incline either. There are declines in life. There are times where you fall in your life. There are times where you fall mentally, where you're having issues, whatever it may be in your life. There are times where you fall emotionally. We are having problems emotionally that are, I'm sure, coming from external things. Maybe, you know, sadness from a person that passes away or whatever it may be in your life. You know, and, and then obviously even more applicable to the context here, there are times when you fall spiritually. There are times where you are going to be on the decline spiritually. It's not just constantly you're climbing, you're going upward. That's not reality, right? There will be times where you are on the decline. And do you know what it is necessary for you to have? Other people to help you. Amen. Other people to lift you up again. Amen. When you're down, you aren't going to lift yourself back up most of the time. You know what you need? You need another person that didn't fall. He's not, on, you know, he's not in the middle of his decline right now. So you know what he's able to do? He's able to pick you back up again. Amen. He's able to lift you back up again. And then later on, when you are the one... That falls, the man that actually picked up his fellow, then your fellow can do the same for you. Then, you, then your brother is able to do the same for you. You know, you, you helped him up last time. Now when you're on your decline this time, then he is going to be there for you to pick you up as well. Everyone here is going to have decline spiritually. Right. Every single person that is sitting in here, all the children that grow up and serve the Lord, they will all have times where they're going down. Hopefully it doesn't last that long for you. And hopefully you don't crash and burn and, and, and it's, and it's, and it's and, you know, destructible to your Christianity. But everyone here will have some type of or some sort of downfall. Everyone. And do you know what you must have in order to help you? Another person there with you. You can't be alone. Do you know what will happen if you're alone in your decline? You'll probably stay there. That's what this is teaching. You, it's not good to be alone because you woe unto him. It's going to be bad. It's not going to be good for you. You may think, oh, you know, I can get out of it. The Bible says woe unto him. Woe unto him. The Bible is teaching that it's necessary to have a second. It's necessary to have another person there. It's necessary to have other people around you and to spend time with other people and to have people that you are close with and friends with and brethren that you have strong relationships with. So when you fall or when you're on your decline, they're there to pick you up. Amen. You put yourself out, you know, all by yourself and seclude yourself, you're setting yourself up for failure. You are setting yourself up for destruct destruction because you're not going to have anyone to help you. 
You're not going to have anyone to lift you up. You're going to be all by yourself. You're going to be out in the field by yourself and have a heart attack. You're going to be up in an attic by yourself and pass out because it's too hot. And you know what you're not going to have? A person there to lift you up. A person there to help you. You're not going to have that other person there to bail you out or to have your back. Right? It is important to have social interaction, to have strong relationships with other people so that they're there to help you for safety or for protection. It is necessary for life. It's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for multiple reasons. It won't end up good in the end. It's, it's, it's not good for, number one, happiness. You will not be a happy person. You will not have happiness. It, there are, I, lo- I was even looking up some studies and stuff. I didn't cite any of them. But there are multiple studies that are just, it, it's, it's extremely clear that you, are a, you, are a, you will be not only just a little bit unhappy, you will be a very unhappy person. If you just, the more time you spend away from other people, the more unhappy you will be. The more sociable you, of a person you are, the happier you will be. This is, this is proven by empirical data where they tested people, they took people, they looked at the lifestyle that they lived. You can even do this, I'm sure, in your own life. You could look at maybe even family members, not only people you went to school with and things like that, but family members that you know maybe, other people that maybe you are somewhat close with. You know the types of people that were the most unhappy? They're the people that spent the most time by themselves. You know why? Because it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for you to go and lock yourself in a room. It's not good to live a life where you're secluded from the world and from human interaction, from socialization. If you are the type of person that likes to be alone, you need to fix that. People change. I don't buy this crap that you're just born and stuck the way that you were born. That you just can't change. This is how I am. I don't buy it. You need to change. Amen. If you're the type of person that just wants to be by yourself, you need to break that habit. That's what you need to do. You need to make it to where you, you need to force yourself to be around others, and then you know what you'll start to do? You'll start to realize how unhappy you were and how happy you are being with people. You know why? Because I believe God. God said it is not good for man to be alone. It's not good for you to be alone. I don't care if you feel like that's how you are or not, or you like to do it, or I don't, it doesn't matter to me. God says that it's not good for man to be alone. So number one, it's not good for man to be alone because of happiness. Because you will be a sorrowful person if you spend a lot of time alone. You need to have a company that you need to have socialization and human interaction. God designed us to communicate, to spend time with one another. You know, it's a reciprocal relationship. Things need to be going back and forth. You need to be spending time with other people. Number two, it's needed for work, just for work in general, more efficient. Number three, it's needed or it's necessary for safety. Number four, it's needed for support. When you have a time where you've fallen emotionally, mentally, uh, you know, furthermore, spiritually, even more so spiritually, it's even more important. You know, moral support, it's needed for moral support. I got a couple of the subset points, and I want to hit on something very specific, and I'm going to be finished. Now, one thing that, that has really disrupted socialization in our society is the use of our modern-day technology, uh, computers and cell phones. Cell phones and computers have damaged, have, have, have hurt very badly, you know, people's social skills today. You know, there are many, especially children today, that, that, uh, that are allowed to spend tons of time on a computer or on technology or whatever, just tons of children. And uh, the, you, what's going to happen is we're going to see an entire generation that doesn't know how to socialize. God did not design you know, us to just to, to basically just be watching a television set or to be you know, looking at a, a cell phone constantly all day. God designed us to socialize with other human beings. It's not good for man to be alone. It's good for you to set your phone down and spend some time with other people, have real interactions. But people today feel like they're socializing when they're on like social media, don't they? They think that that's a form of socialization. It's not at all. It's not all. You know, it's very far from actually socializing. There is, you get, it's so limited what you're able to, to do, what level of socialization it is. When you're, when you're uh, you know, just texting someone back and forth even, or just sending a message. That's why people all the time misunderstand what you're saying. And there's like these big fights that are caused. You know why? 
because it's a very limited version of socialization. You're only getting a tiny, tiny bit. Have you ever, have you ever emailed someone for a long period of time, messaged them back and forth before ever meeting them, and then you finally meet them? At that time, it's a little awkward because you felt like you had this relationship, but you really didn't. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I've done this multiple times with work and stuff. And I was a project manager, and it, you know, not awkward in the sense where it's like, you know, but it, you know, it, it causes this little disconnect because you've talked a lot, but then when you meet each other, you know what you really realize? I don't know you. I don't really know who you are. We haven't really truly met in a real genuine sense. I just read text that you've sent. And I don't really know you on a real level. And then when you sit down by the end of that conversation, you know that person a million times better from actually socializing with them for five minutes than you knew by sending thousands of messages back and forth. Thousands of emails back and forth, you know, you know, having conversation about whatever it may be. In my case, jobs and sending bids and you know, talking back and forth. You actually get to know that person. This is why people are so brazen to be able to say things over social media that they would never say to your face. Because it's not true socialization. And when they really have to socialize with you, they would never look at you and say that to you. And children, what they do is they learn, they, they, they lack and they do not learn the ability to be able to truly socialize. There is so much that you're missing out on of just body language, inflection in someone's voice. There is so much. You can realize when someone's mad at you most of the time, can't you? You can, obviously you can't do that through, through messaging. You know, the, you know the social media is not true socializing. Yeah, hey, it's great if you got somebody that's you know, you know, uh, very far from you. You know, that's 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 living distantly. It's a family member, and you can look at photos of them. They're uploading the photos, and maybe you know, uh, they're, they're, you guys are messaging back and forth and communicating through text or whatever it may be. I do that with my family, but that's not a substitute for real socialization if you have the ability to do so. If you have the ability to look face to face into someone's pupils, that cannot be compared to a text message. So that should never be, or we should never think that, you know, you know, that is true socialization. You know, there, are, there are kids that are that are uh, that, that you'll go to like a doctor's office or something and just constantly on like a laptop or something. You know, obviously none of the kids here do that. But they're just constantly like watching something on a phone or whatever it may be all the time. And you'll notice that some kids can act weird when they're not socializing. Like they don't know how to actually socialize with other children. And they're just awkward acting. They're weird. They want to be by themselves. I'm saying all that to say this. You know, modern day technology can be a major hindrance to building social skills. Even though it's called social media, it can harm you and hurt you very badly. And it can even harm or hurt your relationship. And when you come home from, from work or whatever, you know, husbands need to spend time with their wives and wives need to spend time with their husbands. You know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be like the couple when you go out to eat where both people are on their cell phones and they're like facing each other and they're just on their phones the whole time. You need to socialize with your wife. You need to socialize with your husband. You need to not call, hey, if you got a little bit of work to do, that's fine. That's understandable. But you need to, if you're just, just screwing around or messing around, put your phone down or put whatever it is down and spend time with your family and socialize with your children. You know why? Because it's good for you. God said so. It's good for man to socialize and to interact and to be with other people, to speak with other people. It's good for you. God desired you to have that, that person with you daily, not just so that they're in the house with you. And you go into other rooms and you never talk all the time. What's the purpose? To socialize. To be there. To, to interact with each other. To help one another. To build the relationship. And that's a part of it is the socialization, the communication. You know, when you come home, spend time with your wife. When you come home, you know, spend time with your husband if you're out. The time that you have together, get good quality time with one another because it's important. Because God made us to be sociable creatures. God made us to be creatures and, and, and uh, beings that will you know, spend time with those that, are, uh, you know, that we're close to. Now, um, the other point that I want to hit on is something that, you know, that we've been talking about recently quite, quite often. And, uh, and this, is, this, is, uh, uh, you know, this is the greatest form of, of socialization, the greatest form of relationships that you can build, and it's coming to church. Coming to church. We've been talking about this 
you know, a lot of people have had different ideas about certain things or just questioning and they're not sure. And I've been looking up more and more about this, just, just kind of thinking about the subject of how often to come to church. How often should you spend time with brethren? And I feel like I've purged some answers from the Bible. I started thinking about that if we could put our thumb on something or put our finger on something. And I'm going to show you what I believe from the Bible that the Bible teaches on how often it is that you could or should spend time together in some form or fashion as brethren. Now, I first want to, I want to start with this. Look around. Everybody take a look around at everybody real quick. Look at somebody other than your physical brother, because that's going to de de you know, derive, de deprive me of my point, right? This is your spiritual family that's here. Amen. This is your spiritual family. Everyone that's sitting here are your brethren, you know, right, in the same sense of mankind, right? I realize there's sisters here as well, but that's what brethren means in the Bible. It's everyone, right? Everyone here is your brethren. We're all, this is all your spiritual family. And the Bible teaches that your spiritual family is more important even than your physical family. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. That's, that's, that's biblical. Right. Okay? That's, that's Jesus actually taught that. How often do you spend time with your physical family? Every day. With your brothers and sisters. Now, if your spiritual family is even more important than your physical family, does it sound like it would be too much to ask? And I'm not having church every day. Okay, That's not what I'm saying. Does it sound like, you know, hypothetically that it would be too much to ask for you to spend daily time with your spiritual brethren? If your spiritual brethren is more important than your physical brethren, physical family, does that sound like it's too much to ask? Does it sound totally reasonable, right? You know, the Bible talks about all of us as being family. Over and over again it says, you know, it talks about that he has made, up, made us of one, or the whole family in heaven it refers to in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. The families in heaven. It talks about us being, you know, uh, we're all, the congregation of the firstborn. When you die, where are you going to go? Heaven. Where is every person in here going to go? Where are you going to go, Brother Hall? Heaven. Where are you going to go, Brother Bob? So you know how long you're going to be there, Brother Bob? Eternity. You know how long you're going to be there, Brother Hall? You're both going. So you know what's going to be going on? You're going to be there together for all eternity. With one another. Amen. You think that's too much time to spend with one another? Is that because God, He's like making them, right? He's like, you know, you know but God, he, God designed this, right? This is what God desires is for the spiritual family to spend all eternity together. Amen. Do you think it makes sense to try to say that there's too much time that we're spending with one another? Because when you die, you're going to have to look at my face forever, friend. I'm going to have to look at you and be around you forever. Not like I'm forced to, okay? That's your spiritual family. And if your spiritual family is more important than your physical family, and you spend every day with your physical family, how could you say, spend, you know, I feel like I'm spending too much time with my spiritual family. This is important, and this is, I debated on whether or not I was going to talk about this. Matthew chapter 12, verse 46 says, While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without. So this is Jesus' mother, his physical mother and his physical brother. They're outside. Okay? Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with him. But he answered and said unto them that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And then watch this. And he stretched forth his hand to his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my mother and sister and... I'm sorry, the same as my brother and sister and mother. Amen. You notice what he just did? However you want to look at that. What he did was he, he downplayed his relationship that he had with his physical blood. Right. And he uplifted the relationship that he had with his spiritual family. Amen. He said, who is my mother and my brother? He said, you guys are my family. Right. You're my family. The most important relationship and social and human interaction that you should have should be with your spiritual brother. Amen. The most important relationship that you should have should be with spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ. And people will ask the question, you know, how much church is too much church? That's, that's a ridiculous statement to make. There, there is no point to where you can say, I have too much church. And I'll give you an example. 
And Acts chapter number 2, when the New Testament church really started to grow, I want you to notice how often they spent time together with one another. Notice what it says. Acts chapter 2, verse number 44, And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and good and parted and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily. They continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. Did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So notice the great unity, singleness of heart. And how often did this take place? Daily. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Amen. You know how often they were spending their time together? Daily. Every day. That's how often that they were together. I want you to go to the book of Hebrews now. I'm going to show you something very interesting in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 24. The, the apostles in the early church in Jerusalem didn't think that it was too much to meet every day. And to spend all the day with them. You know why? They're all together all day right now, every day, continually for all eternity. And they will forever be. Because that's where their heart lies. That's what was important to them. That's what that's where they wanted to be. That's the that's what that's where they, they laid up their treasures. You know what it was with? It was with God and with God's people. Amen. That was what was most important to them was their spiritual family. Spiritual things. So we're all very familiar with Hebrews chapter number ten. It's a very very interesting verse. Look at Hebrews chapter number 10. I'm going to make an application after this. This verse and one other can compare them. Hebrews 10, 24 says this. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So notice that one. Paul is writing and saying, let us consider one another. Think about each other and to provoke each other, right? Unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So here it tells you, you know, here's the, the, the command about going to church, right? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now he doesn't give you a specific time in which, you know, you should be gathering or assembling together, right? But then it goes on and says, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. So notice that statement also, exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, one thing you can, you can learn from this, and I want to make this point quickly, is that the closer we get to the end times, how much time should we be spending with our spiritual brethren? More. So are we closer now or when the apostles were there? Now, of course, we have to be, right? So you should be spending more time together. Not Should, should we be cutting back church or adding church? Adding. Or should we be cutting back fellowship with our brethren or adding time where we spend uh, time with our brethren? You should be adding. You should be spending more time. Right? You should be exhorting one another even more. So notice that in that very verse, you know, it makes that statement about exhorting one another. Go to Hebrews 3.13. Hebrews 3.13. So I've heard the, 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 the statement as well where it's, you know, more meeting together or, spend, or fellowshipping, you know, one, any more than once a week is too much fellowship. Look at Hebrews 3.13. And remember, Hebrews 10.24 is in the context of church if you want to get real extreme about this, right? Look at Hebrews 3.13. But exhort one another daily. Now, does that sound familiar? But exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now there's an undeniable parallel here between these two passages. And a clearly undeniable parallel. Every day you need to be exhorting your brethren. Every day you need to be having some sort of fellowship with your brothers and your sisters in Christ. Every day. Now we have our, our, our text message groups and things like that that will speak to one another. And you know that, that, that's good. But we need to be reaching out to one another daily. Amen. That's a commandment from Paul. You need to find a way to exhort your brethren daily. You need to find a way to speak to and to lift up and to provoke. That's what it means, one another daily. So if, 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 if someone ever tries to tell you that having church more than one time a week is too much church, the disciples met every single day. In some form. I don't know exactly how their church services week work, 
But they had a situation there where they sold all their things. They all came together. They, they fellowship constantly. And they all lived together. All the time. And they're having church every day. They're continuing daily in the apostles' doctrine. Every day. We, we see in Hebrews chapter 10 where it's talking about not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. In that exact passage, it talks about exhorting. And we get a form of exhortation while we're here at church. Don't we? And we don't forsake the assembly. We have three services a week. We meet, meet three times a week. And that's a time of exhortation. There's also other times and other ways in which we can fellowship as well. And other times and other ways that we can exhort one another. Where one person can exhort another person. You need to be reaching out and fellowshipping with your brethren in some way or another every day. Every day. And you know what? And so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know, I want to be at church, and we used to do this more often, and I'm going to try to start doing this more often, where I'm inviting people over to my house more often. Other brethren to come over to my house and spend time with me in fellowship at my home. And I would like it to where I could build an environment, or I could build an atmosphere at this church where every brother and every sister at this church enjoy doing that and did that often as well. Amen. Where there's a weekly thing where you're desiring to spend time with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Where you're wanting to fellowship with other brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not good for man to be alone. And there's different types of socialization that you can have in the best type. Is spending time with a brother in Christ. Amen. Amen. The best type is spending time with your spiritual family. Spending time with other brothers and sisters that are saved. You know, we need to make sure that we exalt the relationships that we have with one another. And the time that we spend together. And as you know, the, the, the verse in Psalm says, and I think it's Psalm 45. You know, it says that we need to be planted in the house of the Lord. We need, to be, we need to be, you know, exalting the importance and the significance of church. Seriously. And obviously this whole, uh, you know, everything that I'm talking about, this topic hits close to home. But this is a dangerous subject, my friend. I talk about, I've thought about whether or not I should talk about this specifically. And what I, the last thing that I want is discouragement on how often you need to be meeting. Or how often you need to be spending time together. Because when we look at the apostles, you're not doing near as much as they were. We look at what Paul is talking about in the book of Hebrews. He said that you need to be exhorting one another daily. You see David writing and saying you should be planted in the house of the Lord. Amen. You know, that needs to be where you're... What is, like I said, what is being planted? That's your permanent location. When you die, you're going to be spending all eternity with God's people in heaven. In the congregation of the firstborn. It's actually the church of the firstborn. It's called the book of Hebrews. You're going to be at church constantly, all the time. So don't try to tell me that there's a, a, you know, a measurement in which it's too much church. That, that is sinful. Because it's the exact opposite of what you are compelled to do according to the Bible. What the book of Acts was laid is an example of how often they spend time together. The book of Hebrews, we see there, being, being encouraged or provoked, you that is, to exhort one another daily. And as often as we can, we should be meeting with one another. And I would love to get to the point where, you know, obviously I would, I'm going to stay with Sunday morning and Sunday evening services and Wednesday evening services, but where I'm having other different types of services while I'm working full time for the church. Other things going on on other nights. Maybe like a class where I'm teaching something. You know what? I don't think it would be too much if you came to church every day. You know, I, I know of, uh, you know, uh, obviously uh, everyone, probably, everyone here is probably familiar with, uh, you know, Peter Ruffman's church. And he had a college there, PBI. And he taught classes five nights a week, or four nights a week, I'm sorry, of the week, work week. Monday, Tuesday, you know, uh, Thursday, and Friday. And they had church on Wednesday. And a guy that attended my church moved down there. And he went to church every single service. And for like five years, he went to every single class. Even though they were like repeating the classes after every two years. So it was literally every night he was spending, you know, that time. He's a single guy who's spending that time at the church every single time. You know, would you say, oh, it's way too much church? If you think that, your heart's not right. Yeah. If you think that, hey, I'm spending too much time with my brethren, I'm spending too much time at church, your heart's not right. Your heart is in the wrong place. Your heart is, is caught up in the cares of this world and the things of this world. That's what it is. Now, I want to end with this, and this is extremely important. There is a time to be alone sometimes. 
There's a time even to take breaks from things. Now, in your personal life, there's a time to be alone. Where you're just a little bit, you know, by and large, in general, as a whole, it's not good for you just to be alone all the time. That shouldn't be your, your, you know, your, your disposition, right? Yeah, your predisposition. That shouldn't be your predisposition where you just, that's just how you are. You're always alone. You know, when I read my Bible, I'm alone. When I pray, I'm alone. Those are the times in which Jesus was by himself. That's it. And then he was with other people. He'd go out and he'd pray. And he obviously prayed for you know extremely long time. He fasted for extremely long time. Times that are almost, you know, uh, getting close to being, you know, humanly impossible. That he would spend that time alone. But you know what? You know what he did outside of that? You know what you should do outside of that? Spend your time with other people. Because a general truth is it's not good for man to be alone. There's times when you need a break from things, too. I understand there's a time when you may need a break from church. But you need to kind of withdraw. If you're having some problem, you know, in your life or whatever it may be, or whatever the situation is, maybe you need to take a break while you work those things out. Or you get something fixed in your life. Or whatever it is. But if everything is just fine and dandy, and, you know, you're spending, you know, uh, uh, every, just, just five days a week, you want to go home five days a week and just spend that time, all of that time, just at home. When you have the opportunity of gathering together and exhorting one another daily, or you have an opportunity to maybe fellowship with other brethren, and you don't want to do that, you'd rather spend your time doing something else, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. You need to be desired. You need, you need to want to be planted in the house of the Lord. You need to want, this should be your brethren. This should be, you know, you should, that's how you should think is like Jesus is our example. Who are my mother and my sister and mother? These, this is my, my family here. When you die, you're going to be spending all of your time with your brethren. All of it. All of it. Forever. For all eternity. No ending. You know, Bro Hall will be there all the time, but Martinez, you know, all of the women here, the wives will be there. All of the children, of course. You know, everyone will be there constantly, every day. No break. No breaks. Think about that. Is that too much? You know, this is what it comes down to. Church, the things of God, your spiritual family, that needs to be your top priority. If I was real clear about being a disciple of Christ, there needs to be sacrifice. Amen. One of the things that you need to sacrifice is the family sometimes. You obviously don't sacrifice the family to the point of, you know, where you're damaging them or hurting them. You need to be having time when you're spending time with your wife and your kids weekly. But you know what else? You know what needs to be important? You know what? Even for them. If your kids see you and your wife sees you putting church on the back burner... That's not good for your kids, and that's not good for your wife, friend. You're going to hurt them. You're negatively impacting them when they see where your priorities They can see where your priorities lie, buddy. If that's the type of person maybe that you turn into, that's not good for them. What's going to happen is, you want to go to church a little bit less? Your kid, there's a, there's a saying, I may not get it right, but it's something all the line. My pastor used to say all the time about how the sins that you have your children are going to take them that much further. Oftentimes that's the case. It is. Oftentimes sins get passed down. You know, you know, uh, maybe your 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 father drank alcohol. You know, their, his son ends up being an alcoholic. It's it's a truth of life. Oftentimes that takes place. Normally the sins that you have, you got them from people that you were around all the time. You saw people doing it, whatever it may be. You cut back church a little bit now, your children will probably not go to church at all. They see you cut back and, 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 and not put that in, in, in being a priority. It'll be that even less important to them as well. You're, you're, you're teaching your children things constantly. What's best for your wife and what's best for your children is for you to lead them and show them where your heart should lie and where your priorities should be. Amen. That's what's best for your family. These things are not mutually exclusive where you can't always care for your family, you can't also care for your family at the same time and spend sufficient time with your family and be with your family. 
It's not like it's one or the other. You know what? There are also times where you need to sacrifice things for on behalf of your family. Jesus clearly, clearly told his disciples, if you want to be my disciple, any man comes to me and hate not, you know, he goes through the list of the family, father, mother, brother, says wife, and he doesn't mean like despise your wife, like hate her. You know what I mean? That's not what that means, right? You know? It's saying comparatively or relatively. You know, being, being willing to make sacrifices. It says, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. You know, our heart, our number one, the number one priority in my family in the Baker house is God and doing things for God and God's people. Those that, you know what, over and over again in the book of 1 John, you know what he keeps talking about interchangeably? How you can tell whether somebody loves God if he loves his brethren. When you have a high regard for the people of God and your, and your brothers and sisters in Christ, you'll have a high regard for God. You know, so what, what is first in my house is God. And this is his church that he died for, and he gave himself for, and he sacrificed himself for it. He gave gifts to the church. He cares about the church. The local New Testament church is a jewel to him. He loves it, and he gave himself for it. You know what? I'm here to give myself for it too. And to sacrifice things that I need to for this church. And to do whatever I need on, on, on you know, my part as well. You need to understand how important the local New Testament church is and stand up for it. And this is where it, it, went, you know, it got to a point in my mind where I realized this is something to stand for. And the last thing that I want is people being discouraged away from attending church. I want you to be encouraged and exhorted instead of being discouraged. The exact opposite. And I want you to be contacting and speaking to one another daily and trying to spend more time with each other and growing in singleness of heart and in unity and loving one another more and more as we spend time, not growing further away from one another. Human interaction is extremely important. Human interaction is extremely important and the most important human interaction that there is is the relationship between a brother and that saved, or a sister, that saved, brethren in general. We need to hold our brethren and our sisters in Christ in very high, high regard and care about the church very much. It's not good for man to be alone. Spend time with others. There's many reasons why. I'm not going to go through the points again one more time. I need to wrap this up. Spend time with others. Spend time with your wives. Spend time with other people. Understand the importance of social interaction. When you go home, spend time with your kids. You, you know, you know, you need to be, you know, communicating with people. Communicate with others. Put your phone down, you know, and, and spend time with people. Any opportunity that you get, interact. It's not good for man to be alone. Spend time with your brethren. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. We thank you for creating us and giving us the, the recipes, all of the different recipes to happiness. And helping us understand that it's not good for us if we spend time alone. It's not good for us if we seclude ourselves in the house or seclude ourselves in our bedroom from away from our family or, or whatever it may be. It's good for us to spend time with others. And it's great for us to spend time with brethren. <clears throat> and we help us to look at the apostles as an example and help us to, 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 to grow as a church, to add other people daily to the church, Lord, and uh, that we could love them as well and be good to them and uh, help the church to grow, to, to maybe one time we could have different types of services all throughout the week where we could, we, every day. But even still now, Lord, help us to reach out to our brethren, to care about our brethren, and to exhort one another daily, every single day. Help us to have some sort of fellowship with our brethren every single day. Be with us and bless us. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.